Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Sue Cancervet, and I'm sorry that you're watching this video because if you're watching this video, it means your dog was probably just diagnosed with bone cancer, osteosarcoma, or your veterinarian has told you that they're highly suspicious that your dog has bone cancer. So my goal for this video is to give you an overview of osteosarcoma. I want you to know I have lots of other resources on my Facebook page and on this YouTube channel as well. So be sure to check out the osteosarcoma playlist. One of the things that I think you'll find really useful are the recordings of the live Q&As that I've done where I answer questions from other pet owners like you. And I think a lot of you have very similar questions. So be sure to check that out. And then also check out some of the other vlogs that I have where I've highlighted if there was a patient that had osteosarcoma. So you can see their experience possibly as a tripod, as a three-legged dog. So I hope you'll find that information. But let's dive in because there's a lot to know about osteosarcoma. is osteosarcoma? Well, as I mentioned, it's the most common primary bone cancer that we see in dogs. It's estimated to be about 5% of all cancers that we see in dogs and 85% of bone cancers. So there are some other less common bone cancers that we see in dogs. So things like chondrosarcoma, which is derived of cartilage, fibrosarcoma, which is of connective tissue, hemangiosarcoma, which is a blood vessel, and some other less common ones as well, like histiocytic sarcoma. So it's not the only ones that we see, but definitely, you know, playing the odds, it's the most common primary bone cancer that we see in dogs. When I think about this cancer, I like to think about it in two battle fronts, and that's how we typically are going to approach our patients. So it's locally aggressive. What do we mean by that? It means that this cancer causes lysis or destruction of the bone that it's growing in, and sometimes bone production. So it's gonna lay down new abnormal bone and eat away at your dog's bone, and that's gonna be very painful. And that also is going to cause soft tissue swelling. So what it's doing in the bone of your dog, whether it's a front leg, back leg, so the limbs are the more common, but it could be any bone in the body, that is the local battlefront. And then the second battlefront is because it's highly metastatic. So. 90% of dogs, if we don't follow up their local battlefront, their local uh, treatment, which is usually going to be surgery, 90% of dogs will sadly die within the first year if they're just treated with amputation alone. So that is typically why when we talk about treatment, we're gonna talk about dealing with the local battlefront and then the systemic battlefront, which is typically gonna be chemotherapy, and I'm gonna talk about immunotherapy as well. Less than 10 to 15% of dogs will have detectable spread on those tests that we do before, which are called staging tests. But it is painful. And I know it's really confusing because a lot of the times the dogs that we see this in, they're still wagging their tail and they're still happy and they're still eating, but they are still painful. And the fact that they're not completely putting weight on it is a sign that they're telling you that it's painful. And some dogs, just as some people, have different pain thresholds. It is painful and these dogs do need pain meds. And again, we talked about very high spread rate. The most common place that it's going to spread is to the lungs. That's why we're typically gonna wanna do some sort of imaging of the lungs before we go to surgery and do treatment. Uh, the second most common place is going to be other bones. So you're gonna to wanna to talk to your cancer specialist about what tests we can do about that as well. So as I mentioned, the long bones are the most common place that we see it. So 75% of osteosarcoma is gonna be in the long bones, and it's more common in the front legs than the hind legs. We tend to see this in middle age and older dogs, usually about seven to nine years of age, and there's a second peak incidence of dogs about a year and a half to two years of age. So we can see it in younger dogs as well. 
What we know is that the there are certain breeds that are predisposed and there are some infographics that we'll put a link on my Facebook page. But what's more important is the size of the dog. So this tends to be a cancer of large and giant breed dogs. So dogs that are greater than about 70 pounds are about 60 times more likely and at greater risk for this cancer than dogs that are about like 50 to um, 70 pounds. We still do see this cancer in small dogs. So I'm currently treating a dog named Poppy. Um, it's a little terrier breed and I have a little pug that I've treated on uh, the last year or so as well. So we still do see this cancer in small breeds. There's a little thing that you can sort of remember about where are the most likely places that we're going to see it. So towards the knee and away from the elbow. So away from the elbow is going to be down by the wrist of the dog. That's the distal radius and by the shoulder and that's the proximal humerus and then towards the knee is going to going to be at the end of the femur bone at the top of the tibia bone and then we also see it that phrase is not going to help us remember we do also see it by the hock which is the ankle what is your dog likely to present for if with this the most common symptoms that they are going to have is lameness and swelling in the areas that we talked about. Again, I will remind you that we will often see this in other areas, like you can see it in the ribs. The most common non-limb locations that we'll see it are the, the jaws, the upper and lower jaw, the mandible and the maxilla, and some of the facial bones. Those are the most common non-limb locations that we'll see it. Only about 3% of dogs are actually gonna present with a fracture of their leg, and that's not a negative prognostic factor. What the heck do I mean by that? What I mean by that is those dogs don't do worse. It is very traumatic because a family will have to make a decision more quickly about what to do about that, but those dogs don't statistically do worse than if they didn't have a fracture. Pathologic fracture means that they fractured their leg because of the cancer itself. So normally it's because that cancer is eating away at the bone, it makes the bone less structurally sound and they're likely to fracture. So it could be getting in and out of the car, running to get the door. So just doing something pretty sort of innocent will lead to that fracture. Again, this is a cancer of large and giant breed dogs. So I always you know, remind veterinarians, if you have a large and giant breed dog that has lameness or swelling in one of those high risk areas towards the knee, away from the elbow and the hock, which is the ankle, it's osteosarcoma till proven otherwise. And I really encourage you as a pet owner, if you know that, and again, especially in a high risk breed, you wanna go to your vet and you wanna ask for x-rays that day. If you're not going to do it, because they're gonna get better on pain meds, because the pain meds will decrease the pain, I really encourage you to go back in a week or two, uh, because usually the pain and the sweat and the lameness does not completely go away and get radiographs really, really soon. I see all too often that it's a month or two later, and it can really make it, you know, an impact on these cases. Your veterinarian is gonna tell you typically that they're very highly suspicious based on the x-rays that your dog has osteosarcoma because there's some pretty common features that we get back on the radiology report. That's typically when you are often to be referred to a surgeon or a board certified oncologist like myself. You know, a big question is, do we just go ahead and do surgery and what test do I need to do? So. If you guys have followed me at all, you know that I'm a huge fan of doing aspirates. So that is when we stick a needle in a tumor and collect some cells and look at them under the microscope. And so in general, like for skin masses, for skin lumps and bumps, again, huge advocate, sticking that needle in, collecting some cells and looking at it under the microscope. And this is sort of an exception to the rule. So if I have a dog that is a classic breed, so large and giant breed dog, classic location, classic radiographs in an area where there's not much fungal disease, I am typically comfortable with going straight to surgery without doing cytology or biopsy. And obviously I want you to ideally meet with a surgeon and meet with a board certified radiologist. Vetspecialist.com and vetcancersociety.org, we'll put the links below, are gonna help you find a board certified specialist. So the internet, Dr. Google, YouTube is never meant to replace you know, seeing a doctor and having a specialist meet you, go over your pet and go over their medical records. I'm just trying to give you an overview and make it a little less scary and give you some knowledge and information so you feel empowered. Because I know how scary it is to find out that your pet has cancer or might have osteosarcoma. But before you go to surgery, what I think is not up for question, not you know debatable, is to do three view chest radiographs or a CT scan 
but practically most of the time we're gonna do chest x-rays before you go to surgery. Why? Because we wanna make sure there is not detectable nodules in the lungs because that would be a reason maybe not to do amputation. So talk to your specialist about whether or not you need to do an aspirate or a biopsy of the leg to confirm osteosarcoma before going to surgery, but do those three view chest radiographs before you go to surgery because if there's detectable spread, then it's time to pause, stop, and have a conversation. 90% of dogs have a micro spread mean that we know that there is microscopic cells, microscopic osteosarcoma cells in the lungs that we can't yet see on the chest x-rays. And that's why we have to worry about that second battlefront that I talked about in the beginning of the video. That's why surgery alone is not curative because those, micros, those cells, those microscopic cells are in the lungs. And that's why chemotherapy has actually been shown to be beneficial in extending their survival time. And chemo is really well tolerated, which I want you to watch my other videos and watch the treatment one as well. Of course, we're gonna do some blood work. One of the things that your vet is, and your specialists are gonna talk to you, they're gonna look at something called an alkaline phosphatase. If that's elevated, it's not as good as it's normal. Would I not do surgery if the alkaline phosphatase was elevated? No, I still would do surgery. So that's different than x-rays. You can do a CT scan. It's gonna be a little bit more sensitive. It's gonna be able to pick up smaller nodules in the lungs. So if you really wanna know, you know, you can talk to your um, specialist about the pros and the cons of chest x-rays versus CT scan. The negative of CT scan is it requires anesthesia and it's more expensive. In general, uh, ultrasound to look for spread, not as needed as it would be for some other cancers. But again, if I have something wrong on the blood work, maybe some kidney values elevated or some of the other liver values, I'm gonna talk to the uh, pet parents about possibly doing that. But again, chest x-rays and blood work and urinalysis, super important, ultrasound, aspirates, biopsy of the bone, those are things that you're gonna talk to your specialist about. So that's pretty much you know the test that we're gonna do beforehand. Uh, the other thing that you're gonna to wanna to talk to your specialist about is possibly aspirating a draining lymph node. If the lymph node that drains that bone is positive for spread, that's a negative predictor as well. So then we're gonna focus on treatment and that's gonna be our next video. So be sure to look for that one. I hope you found this helpful. Put your questions below. Be sure, be sure to check out the osteosarcoma playlist. There's also a ton of information, guys, on my Facebook page as well. Uh, each month, uh, you'll find that we do a different tumor. And uh, so we have a whole uh, set of information for osteosarcoma. In addition to the graphics, there is information below those graphics as well. So you can find that there. And a lot of that information will be uh, similar information here. So again, you can uh, find that information there. Hope you found it helpful. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, be sure to comment. If you haven't yet subscribed, please do that. I'd be super appreciative. I appreciate your time. I hope that you found this helpful. Let's kick cancer's butt. And remember, tripods rule. Oh, guys, just in case, we'll t I'll, I'll remind you in the next video, but I have a separate video, a separate vlog. We'll put the link below all about the difficult decision of doing an amputation and lots of my different patients that have and the high satisfaction rate. So again, that's a huge part of the osteosarcoma decision process. So again, be sure to check out that vlog on the decision to do amputation. Again, thanks so much for watching. Kick cancer's butt.